This is Dr. Knut Heim in his teaching on the book of Proverbs. This is session number three, The Fear of the Lord, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, and chapter 9, verse 10. Welcome to lecture three on the biblical book of Proverbs. Remember in lecture two, we were looking at the introduction to the book, verses one to six in the opening chapter. And uh, I had already briefly made reference to verse seven, the kind of uh, quintessential maxim, and in many ways, summary of everything uh, with regard to the book of Proverbs, wisdom and faith. And I'm going to read that again now. And in this uh, third lecture in the series, we will focus almost exclusively on the interpretation of this particular verse and some other related verses that mention specifically the fear of the Lord. And part of the aim of this particular uh, uh, lecture is really to explore with the help of some key texts what the meaning of the phrase fear of the Lord is, and then to apply that with regard to the intellectual enterprise that is the study of the book of Proverbs. So here we go. Verse 7, I read again, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Let me just repeat that again. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. In a moment or two, we will look at the whole of this verse, but for now I want to focus, uh, first of all, on the phrase, fear of the Lord. Then I'm going to look at the meaning that of the word that is translated beginning, beginning of wisdom, um, and then we will look at the antis, uh, antithesis of true wisdom, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord in the second half of that verse. So that's how we're going to do it. So what does the fear of the Lord mean? Well, if we take it literally, which, by the way, I'm suggesting we should not, and I will explain that in a minute, but if we take it literally, what it means is to be afraid of God. Um, and if we were to take it this way and took the phrase literally, then the image of God that we would have here is not so much of a 20th century or 21st century Western teacher uh, where corporal punishment in school is uh, illegal, but we would probably envisage God as some kind of very strict um, uh, teacher with a big stick, um, whom uh, even in Europe, uh, my parents uh, in the 1930s used to know and experience, uh, who would be regularly corporally punished by their very strict teachers at school. So the idea would then be God is this strict kind of parent-teacher figure who will uh, slap our wrists for every little thing we do wrong, and so we better learn what he wants us to learn and study or else. Now, may I suggest this is completely the wrong approach uh, to this phrase, the fear of the Lord. And I'm now going to try and explain that a little bit more. So first of all, I want to say and then um, argue uh, and justify that uh, this phrase, the fear of the Lord, is a so-called idiom. And an idiom is really a combination of words in such a way that the words as a string of words in that sequence mean something, not just something more, but something different from the sum of the meaning of the individual words of the idiomatic phrase. This is a very important principle. Um, 
I give you a few examples of idioms to help you see what I mean by that. So, for example, if I'm a teacher and I've tried to teach you something about, uh, let's say, quantum physics, and then I suddenly interrupt myself and I say, and I hope you've paid attention and you are able to catch my drift. Have you caught my drift? That's an idiom. Now, I have no idea what a drift is in that regard. Uh, does it envisage me uh, sitting on a sledge drifting down a, a snow slope? Or am I drifting on a, on, a, on a float on a river or in an ocean? And how would you catch my drift? What, what kind of catching would that be? No. Uh, the idiomatic phrase, catch my drift, means... Have you understood the deeper significance of what I have been teaching you? Did you catch my drift? Now, nothing in the phrase, catch my drift, has any connection with you gaining a deeper understanding of what I've been trying to teach you. That's what an idiom does. The same thing is true with the phrase, fear of the Lord. And what I now want to suggest to you is that fear of the Lord is an idiom that tries to express obedient trust in God. I repeat that, obedient trust in God. So fear of the Lord does not mean being afraid of God but to have a positive, a trusting relationship with God that then leads to a positively inspired obedience, not because out of fear, but motivated by trust. I'm now going to turn to a key passage that I think uh, explains this very well. And uh, this passage is really from uh, the context of the uh, self-revelation of God at Sinai, uh, at the end of the exodus um, of God's liberation of the people of Israel from a bondage in Egypt. And we are looking at chapter 18 of the book of Ecclesiastes. And just one moment... Sorry, not, not chapter 18. Uh, we are looking at chapter 20 of uh, the book of Exodus. What happens in chapter 20 is that God reveals himself on um, Horeb and um, he um, on Sinai. And the people see God in all of God's splendor and majesty and holiness and might. Uh, it is a very typically ex- uh, described theophany, an appearance of God in, um, in, in modes of existence of God that are perceptible through uh, human senses, like the ears, the eyes, uh, maybe even the, the nose, uh, potentially the touch even. Um, and what happens is the people after this first encounter with God, uh, even the elders of the people who met God on the mountain together with Moses, they are afraid. And they now go and they tell Moses, Moses, God wants to meet with us again tomorrow, but we are afraid, we are scared, we are terrified, and we think it's a much better idea if you go as our representative on your own, and you talk with God, and then God can tell you what he wants us to know, and you can come back down from the mountain and tell us. So here we have a clear uh, context of people being afraid of God. They don't want to disobey God. They do want to obey God, but they're so afraid of God, they don't want to meet with God face to face, but they're sending an intermediary. And so then the following day, Moses does indeed go up to the mountain to meet with God on his own. And the following conversation ensues. I read from uh, verse 18. 
When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. Did you get that? Let me read it again. This is what Moses says. Do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him in you so that you do not sin. So what's happening is here is the very moment of the beginning of the negotiations of the great covenant between God and his people on Mount Sinai, the Sinai or the Sinaitic covenant. The people are afraid of God as God is about to tell them what he wants them to do. And as they send Moses, Moses then tells the people what God wants them to do with this. And he says, do not be afraid, but God wants to put the fear of him upon you. So in this phrase, fear in the sense of terror or anxiety or fearfulness or anxiousness is contrasted with Fear of God. And the very next phrase then explains the nature of the fear of God that God wants to put upon them. And it's this. I'll read the, the whole verse again so that you can catch it in its context. Do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you. Wait for it so that you do not sin. And then God reveals the covenant, the stipulations of the covenant, the commandments and so on to the people of Israel and asks them to enter into a covenant of voluntary obedience in response to the great liberating, saving acts of God that God has done for them in bringing them out of bondage. God now wants them to put their trust in him, not out of anxiety and fear, but out of trust and gratitude, and then to voluntarily, freely obey God out of the deep, um, orientation of their hearts, not out of fear, but because it is the right thing to do. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, how I interpret fear of the Lord. Of course, uh, I'm not there by saying that we should not also have reverence for God, and I'm not also saying that it is not sometimes appropriate to be afraid of God, because God is indeed a very mighty being, uh, and a very holy being, and I don't think we should be blasé in the way in which we interact with God. I think the proper way of interacting with God is one with reverence, with awe, with wonder, uh, with deep humility, and sometimes, quite appropriately, with a sense of our own shortcomings, of our own uh, limitations, um, of our guilt, and maybe our sins at some times in our lives. And then the appropriate way, of course, is to ask for God's forgiveness with fear and trembling. Because we should never take for granted the great and costly mercy of God in God's forgiveness of our sins through the very costly and painful death of Christ on the cross. But that's not what fear of the Lord is about. Fear of the Lord is about a trusting relationship with God that naturally, as a natural outflow of that relationship with God, leads to a godly life. And if you think about it, we actually have a modern 
idiom, which uses exactly this phrase, uh, fear the Lord, um, in an idiomatic way to talk about um, Jews or Christians, modern Jews or Christians, whom we regard as exemplary um, um, uh, people in their faith and in their conduct. And we, we, we talk about people whom we consider to be examples uh, to ourselves or to other people around us, and we speak of them and we say, so-and-so is such a wonderful woman. She is a really someone who fears the Lord. She is a God-fearing woman, or he is a God-fearing man. And when we talk about a person like that, I bet you, if you've ever heard someone tell you about someone else whom they described as a God-fearing woman or a God-fearing man, or you yourself know somebody who is a God-fearing man or a God-fearing woman, you never picture them, and they never picture them as someone who is driven by fear. But you will, I bet you, you will think of someone who naturally lives out their faith in an exemplary way, in a natural way, and in a way that shows deep devotion to God and an obedient lifestyle, an exemplary lifestyle of generosity, of um, love for for one's neighbor, Um, of uh, care for the vulnerable, and so on. That's exactly what fear of the Lord is about. Now, the important thing now uh, in this phrase, and which uh, clearly in in the book of Proverbs is an important one, is this, that, um, and I said this earlier um, in verses 2 and 3 of the opening chapter, the book is a practical book. So the faith that is being fostered in this book is one that naturally should lead to an obedient lifestyle that honors God and contributes to the welfare of other people, naturally. So um, fear of the Lord, then, uh, has to do both with the relationship with God and also with practical, obedient and life-giving, life-sustaining, life-enhancing action in our own lifestyles, in our daily interactions with how we interact with, with other people. That's what fear of the Lord is about. And so uh, in line of that, let, let me now read uh, chapter 1, verse 7 again. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So whatever the word beginning that is translated beginning in the New Revised Standard Version uh, means, which we'll come to in a moment, um, clearly wisdom cannot be had without a personal relationship with God that leads to practical obedient outcome. That's what a very important aspect of wisdom is. It's not a secular thing. It's a religious thing, but it is one that comes out of relationship rather than obligation. Now let's turn uh, to the meaning of the word uh, translated beginning here. Um, the reason why there is, uh, this is worth discussing and why, if you actually look at a variety of different Bible translations, you will see that there's a number of different translations, and in many of the commentaries, there are different interpretations of this, is because, again, uh, here we have another figure of speech, because in the Hebrew, the word for beginning of wisdom is reshit chokmah. And reshit is kind of uh, the Hebrew word, are derived from rosh, which, which means head. So literally, what uh, verse 7 says is, the fear of the Lord is the head of wisdom. And that is what commonly we call a metaphor. What does the head of wisdom mean? Um, it doesn't mean that wisdom is personified here, although wisdom will be personified later on in the book of Proverbs. But um, what uh, the, the word uh, head is used as a metaphor to explain that it has to do 
with some particular aspect of wisdom. And I now will read to you um, a short section, again, from Bruce Waltke's uh, fine commentary in the book of Proverbs. This is from, uh, from page 181, where he uh, justifies his interpretation of the word reshit chokma, the, the head of wisdom. And this is, he translates it also with the NRSV as beginning. And this is now how he explains it. Beginning off, or reshit, might mean, and then he gives three meanings, might mean temporarily first thing. So the first thing of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Or it might mean, he says, qualitatively chief thing. That means the most important thing about wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And then thirdly or philosophically, it could mean principal thing. Principal thing or the essence perhaps. He then says the second meaning ranks the fear of the Lord as just another wisdom teaching and allows that wisdom can be had apart from it. That notion hardly fits this context, which is not concerned as yet to state the specific content of wisdom, but to prepare the way for it. And now here's an important part of the exegetical argument that uh, Waltke presents, he says, the ambiguity, namely, it could mean all three of these things, and by the way, other commentaries have added four and five uh, meanings, actually, two other meanings to the ones that um, Waltke discusses here. Uh, He says, the ambiguity of verse 7 is resolved by the unambiguous word for Beginning of, namely, Tehillat, in the parallel passage of chapter 9, verse 10, pointing us then to the first meaning. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. So that's the argument. So to summarize uh, this rather complex kind of interpretation, what we have is we have an ambiguity. The word reshit head of wisdom, is multivalent. It can have a variety of meanings. Uh, Waltke mentions at least three, but others have a fourth and a fifth one, which I don't want to get into at this stage. Uh, but then he then uses a very traditional and very fine exegetical method that goes all the way back to the ancient rabbi Hillel, who uh, even back in those days argued that obscure passages in scriptures should be interpreted in line with more well-known, less obscure, less ambiguous, and more clear passages. And as it happens, uh, as Bruce Waltke rightly uh, identified, in chapter 9 of Proverbs, in uh, verse 10, we do indeed have a similar expression that is not obscure. That is quite plain and clear. And I'm going to read that to you now. So this is from the book of Proverbs, chapter 9, verse 10. And it says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. And here the word for beginning in Hebrew is the word tehillah, or in the construct, tehillat. And tehillah, there's no question about it, the Hebrew word tehillah means beginning. Uh, So the argument goes, as Bruce Waltke presents it, is he says, well, in chapter 1, verse 7, the phrase, um, the fear of the Lord is the head of wisdom, is ambiguous, we don't really know, and that's a problem. Um, And how can we possibly find the right answer? Ah, but thankfully we have chapter 9, verse 10, which is quite similar it's a similar phrase. Uh, and there is another word which means clearly beginning. So it must mean beginning here as well. And to be honest, this is a very common argument. It's a very convincing argument. And it is almost universally followed by modern scholars. However, <laughs> I want to now argue against that. But as I do so, I want you to know that I am arguing a a minority 
position. I think I'm right, <laughs> uh, but you do need to realize, and I've given you the main line interpretation of, of, of this verse. Um, but here is my interpretation and my argument for how I interpret it. And I want to say, and this is really important to a lot of what we will be doing as we continue to read the book of Proverbs. I want to say this to you, that what we have, and here now I make a broader argument first of all, before I bring it back to the specifics of chapter 1 verse 7 and chapter 9 verse 10. But the broader argument that I want to present is this, that in the book of Proverbs, similar to the book of Job and the Psalter and the Song of Songs, what we have as a genre of literature is poetry. The book of Proverbs is a poetic text. It is a creatively artistic text. It is a text that has been written with imagination. And uh, the person who wrote it, uh, the human author, was a, a, a word smith, a word artist, a word scientist, if you like, uh, a creative person who has written a poetic piece of world literature, including chapter 1, verse 7. In addition to that, of course, not only that, but the divine author of the biblical books across the, the, the biblical canon, but especially even more so in the, in the poetic books, the Holy Spirit is the ultimately creative uh, entity in the universe. So what I'm saying to you is this whole book has been written with imagination. And that brings me to another uh, very highly esteemed colleague of mine, uh, the Spanish, the Catholic Spanish Old Testament scholar, Luis Alonso Choquel, uh, who sadly died a few years ago. Uh, he was one of the great interpreters of uh, Hebrew poetry in the 20th century. It's influenced especially the Spanish-speaking world, uh, Latino scholars across the world, um, uh, and rightly so, a fabulous, fabulous scholar. And in one of his uh, key publications, um, which is called A Manual of Hebrew poet, uh, Poetry, uh, I think published in 1984 or 1988, I can't remember precisely. Um, uh, in this book, he argues that we need to be much more imaginative in how we engage with biblical text in general and poetic text in, 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 in particular. And he coined a catchphrase that I very often quote, and I'm now going to quote it to you, and you will hear me say this again and again and again as we go through this lecture series. And it's this. Simply, what has been written with imagination must be read with imagination. Because it's so important, I'm going to repeat it. What has been written with imagination must be read with imagination. And so what I want to say to you is that uh, when the writer of chapter 1, verse 7, uses a metaphor, a poetic expression, rather than a literal word for beginning, there was a reason why he did that. The argument of Waltke and others, although they don't say that, uh, implies that the artistic expression, the head of wisdom, is a problem. It's actually a shortcoming in the literary production of this very important verse. Um, and frankly speaking, although most scholars wouldn't actually say that, uh, the implication behind the argument is that the author of 1.7 made a mistake. They used a flowery uh, poetic expression and confused us poor readers by creating terrible ambiguity. And now we have this problem and we don't know what it means. Thank goodness uh, someone else or he himself later on corrected himself in chapter 9 verse 10 and told us plain what it means. Really? <laughs> really? Would you not think 
that at the in, uh, in the in, uh, introduction to the book, where the author wants to help us to know how to approach the book and tells us, this is what you're going to learn, these are the kinds of people uh, I want to engage with the book, this is the kind of practical application that should come out of it, and these are the religious um, and spiritual attitudes you should have and strive for as you engage in the educational enterprise you are about to embark on, um, do you really think that that author didn't think through what he said when he comes to the most important part of his introduction, this fabulous religious maxim, the fear of the Lord is the reshit of knowledge. You really think he made a mistake? No! The ambiguous, the multivalent expression that says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the fear of the Lord is the most important thing about wisdom, the fear of the Lord is the very essence of wisdom. He wanted to say all three of those with one expression. This is deliberate ambiguity. This is ambiguity as an asset rather than a drawback. This is beauty. This has been written with imagination in order to engage our imagination so that we realize that our relationship with God and our natural willingness to be obedient out of gratitude is not only the beginning of knowledge, not only the most important thing about the intellectual enterprise, but it is the very essence that will help us to reach the highest goal of true wisdom education, where it becomes part of our very self, so that we engage in this intellectual enterprise wisely with a deep religious spiritual attitude that enhances rather than restricts the educational achievements that we are about to reach for. So remember then, as you engage, not only with this lecture series, but of course uh, through a continual reading and study of the book of Proverbs, for its own sake, uh, irrespective of the lectures that you're hearing now, uh, the essence, the most important thing and the beginning of it all, uh, of the wisdom enterprise, is the fear of the Lord. And uh, now I want to just connect a little bit with something I said earlier in Lecture 1 uh, when I introduced the whole of the book. Uh, we mentioned that, um, on the one hand, the book of Proverbs does not mention any of the key religious concepts that are so important in all of the almost all of the other books of the Bible, both in the Old and in the New Testament, namely the covenant with God at Sinai, um, or the temple, or priests, or sacrifices, or the Exodus. Yeah, none of this is mentioned in the Book of Proverbs. Uh, which has uh, in the past, in the, in the kind of mid-20th century, uh, led some scholars to argue that the wisdom of the book of Proverbs is a secular wisdom. Uh, most famously done by um, William McCain in his uh, Old Testament library uh, commentary um, on Proverbs uh, from 1970, where he argued very um, strongly that wisdom literature is largely secular. Uh, similarly, James Crenshaw sometimes comes close to saying this. And these are some of the great, um, very influential uh, scholars of biblical wisdom literature in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Now, um, having said that, though, I also said in the introduction 
that uh, the book of Proverbs is kind of naturally kind of low-key religious. It just takes faith in God for granted. And the reason why I said that then is precisely because of phrases to do with the fear of the Lord, like in 1.7 and 9.10. And I now want to just take you to do uh, two more of these phrases, but there are many more. The phrase, the fear of the Lord, is the, this very important key phrase, recurs throughout the book of Proverbs. And roughly 10% of the 915 uh, verses in the book of Proverbs, so we're talking about 91 verses roughly, in the book, is that right? Yep, yeah. um, 91 verses uh, talk about or mention God or allude to God directly or at very least quite clearly indirectly. So God is almost on every page in the book. Um, and uh, the fear of the Lord, uh, here is one, in chapter 2, which we will deal with in more detail in uh, one of the next lectures, um, says, uh, My child, if you accept my words, in verse 1, and if you learn about wisdom, verses 2 to 4, then, in verse 5, then you will understand the fear of the Lord, here's our word again, our idiom, and find the knowledge of God. So ironically, I think, and here now I want to expand this idea from Waltke saying there are three meanings to do with head of uh, wisdom. Um, in chapter 2, verse 5, the pursuit of wisdom leads to the fear of the Lord and, um, in the parallel phrase, knowledge of God. So while in chapter 1, verse 7, uh, head of wisdom is fear of the Lord, uh, it says that it is the fear of the Lord that is one of the energizing, enabling features that will help you acquire wisdom. But now, conversely, in chapter 2, it's the other way around. It's when you learn about true wisdom, such as the one presented here in the book of Proverbs, and I would add, by the way, as a Christian theologian, um, in the book of Job and in the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, that are similar wisdom texts, or kind of wisdom texts, I'll come back to that uh, later in another lecture. Um, it's also, if you study this kind of wisdom, it will help you to live an obedient, trusting life in a direct relationship of personal knowledge of your creator, your redeemer, and your savior, your sustainer, your guide. So um, this idea of the head of wisdom is far more rich than Bruce Waltke and many others have until now allowed us to see through their arguments. I now want us to go to chapter 15 very briefly. Here's another key phrase. Um, Chapter 15, verse 33. The fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom, and humility goes before honor. Now, I, there's a lot that could be said about this verse, but notice this now is kind of a metaphoric expression where the fear of the Lord on the one hand and instruction in wisdom are made to be one and the same thing. The fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom. They are one and the same thing, metaphorically speaking. Not literally speaking. Yeah, it's not an ontological one is exactly the same as the other. But metaphorically speaking, um, as the book of Proverbs continues to develop and unfold, we are now told that as we are in being instructed in wisdom or as we study wisdom texts like this one, we are actually engaged in the very process and activity and, and state of being of being God-fearing men and women of God. 
So what I want you to see through this is that really the book of Proverbs is thoroughly theological. And it is relational in its theology. It's about knowing God. And it's practical in its theology. It's about the theology making a difference in our lifestyles, in our values, in our decision making, in the way we interact with others and contribute to the common good. So remember, fear of the Lord is absolutely essential to wisdom. This is Dr. Knut Heim in his teaching on the book of Proverbs. This is session number three, The Fear of the Lord, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 and chapter 9, verse 10.